Yesterday, somewhere in North America, a children's school was holding a Pride Month celebration, as you're aware, this is June, and many of the Muslim children did not show up, and they came after the parade finished. The teacher brought the Muslims into uh, the classroom and severely reprimanded the children. Maybe you've heard the audio has gone viral. And this isn't the only time this has happened. A few months ago in England, uh, a video went viral where a, a young child, a teenager or something said that you cannot be uh, queer and Muslim at the same time. And the, the teacher literally went ballistic on the child, yelling and screaming that tolerance is a British value. If you're British, you must be tolerant. You know, so yelling and screaming that you have to be tolerant at this 15-year-old uh, you know, Muslim kid. So we, this is not the only time. Today as well, I just tweeted something's happening in Maryland a few months ago in, in Detroit. I mean, this is now becoming a national crisis. And some key points are raised that we need to have a national conversation on. Some of the points that are being raised is that tolerance is a two-way street. The teacher said in this audio clip that if you want to be tolerated as a minority, you have to return the favor and tolerate other people that are minorities, okay? Quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. The teacher said in this audio that last month they had a Ramadan awareness and everybody came. Last month or two months ago, they had Ramadan awareness and the whole school was aware, uh, raising awareness of Ramadan. Today, the teacher said, we have LGBT. How come you did not come? So you're not being fair in this, uh, in this understanding. The teacher also said, that if you don't agree with these values, then you need to go back where you came from. If you don't agree with these values, you don't belong here. And the British teacher also said similar things, that these are British values, right? Tolerance is a British value. If you don't have this value, then you don't deserve to be in Britain. And all of this, by the way, it is actually frightening that the power dynamics are so unequal and nobody seems to be commenting on this. You have a grown adult in a position of authority. You have a teacher that is in a position of authority yelling and getting angry at a young middle school teenager who's trying to make sense of the world. And instead of even if you firmly believe in your worldview, even if you do, is this the way you should get your point across as a teacher to a student, yelling and making the student feel intimidated? So today's brief khatira, today's brief topic is to tackle this philosophy head on. Like, wallahi, my heart felt for this 15-year-old child. My heart went out to these youngsters. They're lost. What do you say to an adult screaming at you? What do you say that... If you want to be tolerated, your brown skin, basically, your brown skin, your Arab Muslim background, your weird from the perspective of our culture, we're tolerating you. If you want to be in our society, they say, you had better tolerate these people as well. What do you expect a 15-year-old to respond? Well, I felt, yani, so it's our job to give them some talking points. That's the purpose of today's khatira. I hope, inshallah, we begin that conversation. I'm not going to say I have definitive answers because this is a complex topic. How do you explain to this you know, teacher, how do you explain that that analogy is incorrect? And we have to give these simplistic, waterproof talking points to the next generation. And we also have to explain to our own kids at home because that's what they're telling us, right? That, hey, you know, if you want to be tolerated, then you have to return the tolerance. It's a two-way street over here. So as usual, I divide my talks into specific points so that we remember. So five points today, inshallah, five points. The first point, purely from a philosophical standpoint, taking a step back and commenting on the reality of uh, what's going on in the left versus right divide because you have the liberal progressive left you have the conservative right here right we begin by pointing out the logical inconsistency within the progressive left because the progressive left does not actually have a consistent methodology from within Really, the progressive left is basically a bunch of different ethnicities, ideological groups who don't have anything in common amongst themselves except that they don't like the right. That's really all they have in common, right? In reality, within themselves, there is no usul, no standard paradigm, no consistency. You have within them, basically, people who are mutually contradicting each other. 
And that is why, ironically, pre-9-11, as you're aware, most Muslims ideologically sided with the right. Because they felt familiarity, they felt comfort, family values, consistency, right? Because of 9-11, the right hated us for our religion, not our values. So they wanted to kick us out. The left, for the first time in American history, took us in. But they took us in not because they loved us for who they, we are. They took us in because they wanted to demonstrate diversity. They wanted to demonstrate inclusiveness. But here's the point. What is inclusiveness and diversity? How can you reconcile cultural relativism versus universal human rights? How can you praise other cultures while you want to enforce your own? There's a contradiction. This is the contradiction of the left. I want you to understand this point. The left says we want to tolerate and we want to embrace diversity. Okay, what are you going to do when that diversity goes against something you think is sacred? How can you respect something that goes against your own value system? And so the left is beginning to understand. And this union of all of these left progressive groups is now dismantling. It is now coming apart. Because in the end of the day, the left accuses the right of being, hip of being bigoted, of being intolerant. Guess what? Now we're seeing the left is just as bigoted and just as intolerant, but over different issues. The right is consistent. We want people that look like us, talk like us, act like us. We want people of our ethnicity, our culture. Obviously, that is threatening to us because we're not from their culture. But they're being consistent from where they're coming from. We don't like it because we are the minority here, right? But the left doesn't have a consistent paradigm to respond back to them. So what they really have is a group of disconnected ethnicities, ideologies, religions that have nothing in common other than they don't like the, the, the status quo. They don't like one ethnicity and the default. Once the left is now on the rise, once they are dominant, and they are dominant for the last, this, you know, this president cycle, whatnot, now you're going to see the fault lines from within. And that's what's happening with us. We were tolerated as long as we could be a feather in their cap of diversity. We were tolerated as long as they could showcase, ah, oh, look, we're even tolerating the Muslims. But when we want to enforce our personal values in our life, we are no longer tolerated. So it was a facade, it was a hypocrisy. You didn't really want inclusion and diversity. You didn't really want, because legitimate diversity would mean you accept us for who we are. That's legitimate diversity. But obviously it can't be that case. So this leads me to my second point. For any Westerner, for any person whose ancestry goes back, you know, more generations than ours in this land, to claim that tolerance is a Western virtue. Wallahi, what can you even say? Tolerance is a Western virtue? How short is their amnesia? How quickly they forget. And it was said to me, I'm not sure that the teacher yesterday in that school was a history teacher, which makes it even more ironic. A history teacher is saying the West is a tolerant society. This is our value. Since when? Since when is tolerance a Western virtue? You want to begin and open up the box of history? Never in human history has slavery existed in a worse fashion against a specific ethnicity than in America. You want to open up tolerance? Jim Crow laws. You want, laws. You want to open up tolerance? The internment of 100,000 Japanese Americans simply because they were a different ethnicity. And this is in our lifetimes, 1942. You, know, you want to open up intolerance? Tolerance in Canada, in Australia, and other other places, how they treated the local indigenous, taking away their children, forcibly telling them they cannot speak their language. This is now well known in the 60s and 70s. The people of that generation are now adults. This isn't, this isn't centuries ago. Children were taken away from their parents in the 40s, 50s, and 60s forcibly taken away. Why? Because they were from the indi indigenous people. This happened in Canada. This happened in Australia. As for America, this happened before this point in time. Recently, not as recent. But in Canada and Australia, we're talking about our generation. The people that are now adults, this happened to them. Tolerance? Whose tolerance? So again, this quick amnesia of tolerance is our 
virtue, our, you know, our uh, progressive right. The fact of the matter is that hardly any culture and civilization has demonstrated more war and more intolerance than overall the trajectory of Western history. In fact, the irony of ironies, when this child, this Muslim child, is wanting to enforce family values, they are returning to the values of Western culture for more than a thousand years. Even LGBT laws, tolerance for a thousand years, LGBT was not tolerated for a thousand years. This is in our lifetime, it is switching. So this child, if we tell him what to say, what this child should say, actually forget my ethnicity. I'm going back to your ethnicity. I'm going back to your forefathers. I'm going back to your culture for a thousand, five hundred years, two thousand years. How your own society understood this phenomenon. That's what I'm going back to. What are you going to say, tolerance? LGBT laws were only in our lifetime reversed. The Supreme Court ruling took place around 10 years ago. So don't come and preach me, we are a tolerant society. You are changing day by day, and you expect just because you change, everybody else is gonna change at your pace. Even if you believe you're right, the way you're going about this, of course, they're not right, but even if you believe you're right, the sheer arrogance of forgetting your own history, you are not tolerant in the slightest, and now you're screaming at a 15-year-old child. The irony of screaming, you have to be tolerant to somebody who doesn't agree with you is, is lost on these people. You cannot force somebody to be tolerant. You want to be tolerant? You begin by being tolerant of somebody you don't agree with. And in this case, it's becoming us as the Muslim community. The third point here, again, has to be said. There is a clear, blatant racism. How so? Xenophobia. And this is coming from the left, which used to criticize the right for racism. This is the irony. The left would say, we like people of different colors, different backgrounds. The left would say, we are against the bigotry of the right. Okay. Allah says in the Quran, Hatred has come from their tongues, and their hearts have even more hatred. Allah says in the Quran, They're never going to be pleased with you. So whoever thought that the left would permanently protect the Muslims, I'm sorry, open your eyes and see this reality. The same group that would criticize the right, when the right said to us and to the Hispanics and to the African Americans, go back home, the left would say, how dare you? Now, from from the tongues of the left, the exact same thing. If you don't accept our values, this teacher literally said it's on the audio, go back to where you came from. The exact same phrasing. But here's the question, and especially this teacher is from Canada, right? The irony, Canada is an immigrant country. Even America, we have to, what is America? You know, if, if, if a person who's a white background, if his father or her father came, landed on Ellis Island in 1948 from Dublin, Ireland, right? Okay, I will say my father landed in Houston, Texas in 1962. 15 years difference. I was born and raised here. I've never had any nationality, any uh, uh, citizenship other than this country. Why would you say, if I disagree with you, I should go back home? Your father came to Ellis Island. You can go back home if you don't like me. But here's the point. Subtly, there is white privilege. And this is a term they hate. This is a term they say they don't have. But the fact of the matter is they're demonstrating this. How can you say to somebody, you go back home if you don't agree with me, when you yourselves and your ancestors came from somewhere else? There's only one difference, skin color. Because in this case, they're not even Christian. It's not even Christian Muslim. There's one difference. It's the privilege of ethnicity and background. And so the left that claims to be open-minded and tolerant of all, even ethnicities, when push comes to shove, they think this country is theirs. And the response, why do you get to define values? I'm, a, I'm an American, I'll speak for myself. I'm born and raised here. I have only one nation. I've never had any nationality. This is my country. Why can't I have a stake in these values that you say tolerance is a British or an American or a Canadian value? Guess what? I'm an American too. So many others of us are American too. Why can't we to collectively also get involved and talk about what does it mean to be tolerant? How come you get the privilege of defining values? I'll tell you why. Because my skin color is a few shades darker. And so, what has happened? That hatred that was hidden in their hearts, it has now come out. Allah tells us in the Quran, don't be fooled, brothers and sisters. I've said right from here, I've said multiple times, 
We are neither left nor right. We're neither Republican nor Democrats. We have to be above this. We are Muslims. And sometimes in some issues, one group would be better, in other issues, other. But never should your heart be attached to identity politics. We are above this. So this is my third point here. Subtle racism, subtle privilege of their ethnicity. We own our values. This is our country, and it's not their country. It's equally ours. That's the vision of this country. Technically, it's equally ours. But realistically, you think it is yours and not mine and therefore when I disagree with you it comes out go back to where you came from and I don't have the right to say to them why should I go back to where my grandfather came from you should go back to where your grandfather came from because your grandfather colonized and pillaged and raped the native Indians my grandfather didn't come and do that in reality I have more right to this land because we came legally we paid taxes from day one we worked our way out from bottom all of us we know this we came with nothing in our pockets my father came with 20 bucks in his pockets worked his way to where we are hard work as for you guys pillaging plundering raping bombing Hiroshima that's what you guys did so in reality we have more right than you do but if we say this they're gonna say oh and you know the reality they feel that type of privilege so this is the third point the fourth point let's get now to the technicalities they say respect is a two-way street they say quid pro quo you scratch my back I scratch your back they say we had Ramadan month now we have LGBT month. How do you respond to this? Herein lies the fundamental issue that we have to educate our youth to stand up and respond to. They are comparing apples and oranges and they don't seem to understand that. They are comparing completely different things and putting them in the same box. They think ethnicity and religion and sexuality are all types of the same manifestation. They compare skin color and ethnicity with religion, with sexuality. And for us, each one of these is a completely distinct reality. It's comparing apples and oranges and bananas, literally completely separate. Ethnicity, skin color is not a choice. I don't choose my skin color. I don't choose where my parents ethnically are from. And so we would make the logical, the rational, and the Islamic argument, ethnicity should be neutral. We have logical, because it's not my fault, ethnicity is not a crime, ethnicity is not a choice, ethnicity is something that is my skin color, and ethnicity should be neutral. So to celebrate ethnicities, to celebrate ethnic diversities, this should be completely normal and accepted. As for faith, here we get to a different reality, faith is a choice. I choose to be Muslim. Faith is a choice. Faith involves multiple aspects of ritual, of theology, of life and death, of ethics, of values. They are not all the same. You, from an agnostic background, might think they're the same. But within the faith traditions, they are mutually exclusive. You either believe Jesus is the Son of God or you don't. You either believe Buddha is this or Krishna is this or, the, or, or you don't. It's mutually exclusive. And therefore, here's the irony. We as Muslims will say, if we have a Ramadan festival or an Islam festival where non-Muslim children are forced to pray according to our salah and a Christian says, I don't want my son to participate in that ritual. What should our stance be, brothers and sisters? What should our stance be? If the father says, I, I'm a Christian and I don't want my son to participate in a religious festival. We must support the freedom of the father. We must support because we're being consistent now. We must say, you know what? We agree with you. We agree with you. If you know, a bunch of children are being forced to participate in a religious ritual, in a festival, in a ceremony that is uniquely religious, then yes, it's not the same as ethnicity. And we will then say we we'll agree with this. But then here's the awkwardness. Being participating in a ritual is not the same as being taught. So if you're taught about Ramadan, it's not the same as being forced to fast on the day, obviously, right? If you're taught Muslims believe there's one God, and our children are taught Christians believe Jesus is the Son of God, okay? Here we get to this gray area, and each parent is going to be on his own. Me personally, if it is taught from a completely descriptive fashion, descriptive, I am fine with this, as long as the child is old enough, like teenager or something. Not a five-year-old, but world history class when they're in high school. Okay, learn history without proselytizing without preaching 
And the Quran teaches us what the Christians say, the Jews say. The Quran teaches us world history. No problem, in my opinion. Maybe some of you will disagree, but in my opinion, we separate teaching neutrally versus asking the child to participate. So, if you were to have a Ramadan day and you teach everybody, Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan. And for one day, a Muslim comes, says his Ramadan experience. That's one way. I don't see a problem. And if you were to have on Passover, a Jewish person comes, says, Passover is the day God bless the children of Israel. I personally don't have a problem with this because this is teaching. But if you were to have, everybody has to participate in the Passover festival. No, that's not right. So you have to be a little bit more nuanced over here. Now, the last point, sexuality, in this point, of, uh, point number four. Sexuality is completely different. It's neither ethnicity nor faith. Sexuality has so many multiple things. One's own personal values, one's own concept of decency, one's own religion, one's own ethics. For the board of the school to take charge of how sexuality will be taught. I'm sorry, no, we have to put our foot down here. The board, the school should not be in the business of teaching sexuality. Teach us chemistry, physics, maths. Teach us biology. Teach us the world. Don't teach us values about Intimacy, that's something the parents should be in charge of. And so here we would say, and especially by the way, once this version of sexuality comes in, now we're talking about normalizing that which is abnormal, LGBT. We're talking about suggestive partial nudity and dancing. All of these festivals, they bring in somebody who cross dresses, you know? They bring in somebody, man dressed like a woman, woman dressed like a man, acting like a man. Now this isn't education anymore. This is indoctrination and normalization. So we draw the line over here. Now the point comes from the perspective of these people, ethnicity and religion and sexuality are in the same box. For us, we can make a logical and a historic and a rational argument that each of these three is different. We can, but easier than this, we just bring in the religion card and we say our faith says these three are different because that is watertight. If you open up biology and history, they will go back and forth. And we can, logically you can say, how is ethnicity the same as religion? How is religion the same as sexuality? But the simple thing to use is to say, we have our ethical values from our Lord. Allah tells us right from wrong. My brain could be right and wrong. My understanding, we hope it's right, but it could be wrong. Collectively, we could be right or wrong. For multiple generations, this country thought slavery was good. If in that stage somebody said, we should endorse this and we're teaching it in school. If in that stage somebody said, you have to live up to our values of slavery or else you can leave. What are you going to say to them? We have a higher source that tells us what ethics, what law, what morality is. And you don't agree with this source. But we believe we have a divine source that is error free. As for you, you keep on changing. Every few months and years, you have a new value, a new idea. And we need to push back. You don't know, Allah knows. You think you know, you don't know. And your history shows you don't know. You're experimenting like cocktails every few years, a new idea, a new thing. And even within your own movement, there are so many multiple contradictions. Now the trans movement, by the way, many people who are non-religious, they find this absurd. How can a person just say he's a woman and then a man and then walk into the woman's locker room? Parents are getting angry at this. How can a man at the age of 30, 40 pretend he's a woman and then participate in the Olympics or in the women's sports? How can, and this is happening now and even non-religious people are, 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 are saying this is, doesn't make any sense. So internally they're inconsistent. They don't have a higher value. This is the fourth point here that we have a higher set of values that tells us Ethnicity and religion and sexuality are separate things. The fifth and final point. We need to push back at what does it mean to respect? What does it mean to respect? The teacher all over in America and Canada and England, they say you must respect this other ideology. Recently, a group of, of ulama came together. I was on the, 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 the board of this. And they, we, we, we formulated a document called Navigating Differences. Google this document. It's all over the news right now. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I was involved. I wasn't the main person. Sheikh Hatim, Dr. Hatim Al-Hajj was the main person whose idea and whose... But I was on the team to craft and to write this, uh, this document. Alhamdulillah, over 300 ulama from across North America, from all backgrounds, all backgrounds 
Salafi, Sufi, Shi'i, Deobandi, Barilvi, Tablighi. I'm mentioning them because I want you to know this is something that there is no ikhtilaf. Doesn't matter which firqa, which madhab you belong to. We have prime signatories, well-known ulama from every strand of Islam. They have endorsed this document. So please read this document. In this document, we say, I'm quoting from this. Peaceful coexistence does not necessitate agreement, acceptance, affirmation, promotion, or celebration. I want to read that again. Peaceful coexistence. Nobody's saying, Astaghfirullah, we go kill somebody. Nobody's saying, we go punch somebody in the face, right? A lot of, you know, the more hardcore critics, they got angry. Peaceful coexistence, how can you say this? And the response is, what do you want us to say? You, are, you, are you calling for violence? We say to the critics from inside who, what, what, what do you want us to say? We are citizens of this country. We are. And we're not calling for violence. And we have to put our foot down here. We're not calling for shoving and pushing and punching. And, and no, peaceful coexistence does not necessitate agreement. I don't agree. You're drinking. I don't agree with it. It doesn't mean acceptance. If you want to cut your body parts, I don't accept it. I think you're doing something very wrong. Affirmation, I don't affirm. You, this is a figment of your imagination. Promotion, I'm not going to wave a flag. Or celebration, I'm not going to participate in a parade that is celebrating this thing. Peaceful coexistence does not mean this. Then the document says, we refuse the false choice between succumbing to societal pressures to adopt views contrary to our beliefs, i.e. we must acquiesce and agree that you have correct beliefs. And the other side, facing unfounded charges of bigotry. The two options were being given. Either you celebrate or you are a bigot. We say no. There is a third choice. That third choice, we do not agree. We actually strongly disagree. We think this is wrong. We think this is dangerous for society. We're not going to celebrate. We're not going to endorse. But if your law has passed it, if your Supreme Court has passed it, what do you want us to do? I don't have to agree to the Supreme Court to be an American. Muslims of America, we need to be firm on this point. Look at before the abortion debate. One third of Americans, before they overturned Roe versus Wade, one third of Americans said, we don't support the Supreme Court's decision of abortion. Okay, those one third, because they were white evangelicals, nobody dared say to them, if you don't like our country, Go back to where you came from. Do you understand this point? One third of this country said we don't support the Supreme Court's decision about abortion. Famous intellectuals would say those who perform abortion, they're murderers. Some people killed abortion doctors, vigilante justice. Some people became terrorists and they would literally shoot abortion doctors. Right? Nobody said the whole movement is terrorist. Nobody said this. I'll tell you why. Because their ethnicity is different than ours. Let's be brutally honest. I'm sorry to be blunt here, but they have white privilege. White Christian privilege. I'm saying this bluntly. Because they're white Christians, they got away with what they got away with. As for us, we have to be super careful in our language, in our couching, whatnot. May Allah protect us. If one crazy person does something, we all get into trouble. You know this, right? But when one crazy person does it amongst them, nobody amongst them gets into trouble except that one person. You know this reality. Anyway, my point is, the fifth point, we don't have to respect your values to be American. We have to be blunt here. My Americanness has nothing to do with endorsing the current status quo. I have every right to disagree, Islamically and constitutionally. And we need to own we need to be blunt. We need to be firm. We need to teach our teenagers to own their own identity. Be a proud Muslim and be an American and say as a Muslim and yes, as an American, I don't have to agree with the Supreme Court. I don't have to agree even with the, the majority opinion of this country. And doing so makes me no less of an American. That's the reality actually. Technically, that is the reality. So bottom line, brothers and sisters, this is the beginning of a conversation. It's not an end all. I hope inshallah with this, you will also come back to me with other points. And I hope the goal is, inshallah, if not myself, other people should, I'll try to, but I, mean, I only have so much time, should actually make a PDF for our high school kids. These are the talking points. We should literally distribute it 
to our next generation. This is how you respond next time a teacher yells at you that you're being bigoted, you're being homophobic, you're not tolerating and being respectful. We need to teach them. There are five simple points you need to say back, and these are some of them. And if we have more, inshallah, we can add to the list, this list. Bottom line to, uh, to conclude, these trials and these fitan, inshallah, there's also good in them. We have to know this. Nothing happens except there's good in it. And perhaps one of the good is that we are all going to be forced to be religious activists in our households. Perhaps one of the positives, we cannot afford to be silent or else your children will no longer be practicing Muslims. Their version of Islam is going to be something, A'udhu Billah, may Allah protect us. So perhaps one of the positives, every one of us now, we have to make a stand. We have to educate ourselves, we have to educate our children, and in that process, maybe, just maybe, inshallah, we will preserve their identity in a way we would otherwise never have preserved. So Allah is using this as a catalyst for us. Allah is using this to motivate us to be better Muslims in our lives so that we can pass our religion down to our children. And inshallah, more conversations will follow. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا